This robotic head, this butter passing robot, and this robotic hand all have one thing in common. I built them in a month. In fact, for the last one and a half years, I've made a robotic project every month. Some straight up sucked, but others were somewhat cool. Three months ago, I let my viewers vote on polls to decide how I should build a mini space rover. And let me just say, you guys chose the hardest, most technically challenging ways of building this rover. On every single damn Pole. But I'm gonna build it anyways, mama didn't raise no bi- First of these poles is about motor choice, and motors are obviously a pretty crucial component of the rover. They're gonna dictate how fast the rover goes, and how easily it's gonna climb objects. I've thrown together an initial prototype to answer that question. Now, one thing to note here, the pole dictating motor choice voted for larger motors. But guess what? These big ones have proved to be completely asked source. So at the time of this test, I've only managed to get my hand on the smaller versions and I've got an order coming from China, don't worry, for the larger ones. It's just taken a while. Anyways, I've thrown together a small obstacle course to test the initial prototype. We are primarily interested in seeing if this simple rover design I came up with in a fever dream can actually climb anything. The rover climbed the first object really damn well and as an added bonus, even though it was only the left side that climbs an object, the right side still maintains stability, which just means it stayed on the ground. Which is actually awesome performance, considering an unknown planetary surface is probably not going to be as flat and non-rocky as my comedically long and <laughs> narrow kitchen floor. Look at the mess! Our second object, which is this cardboard box, aimed to test the same thing, but on the right side. Yeah, it didn't exactly work. The box was just so light that the upward force couldn't overcome the weight of the rover arm before it pushed it. So uh, we're just gonna call that ability to push light things out of the way a feature. Our third object is this NVIDIA GPU case that I picked up five years ago that I intended to make a PC from but never did, so it's just been picking up dust. But the good news is that the box is convenient height, width, and weight for this very specific test. So that's $200 well spent. The rover climbed this really well. For all this initial prototype's brilliance, it did have one big problem. I designed the connection to the platforms as this really hard to assemble pin joint. Ignoring the fact that that took literal hours to screw together, the biggest problem was the unintended rotation of the legs, which caused it to struggle to go exactly straight. But potato potato, it's a rover. It's not very good looking, but it does what I want. But psych, that's not good enough for my subscribers because you know how many of these poles this rover covers? Absolutely none of them. Motors? Nope. These are the smaller ones. Choice of microcontroller? Yep, it's the wrong one. And yeah, you can probably guess that I'm not controlling this from a Raspberry Pi right now. The first poll we're gonna score off is this one. To get our rover to move, I was sending commands to a microcontroller, which in turn moved the motors through some hard soldered circuitry. But we're gonna transition this microcontroller to an ESP32. Why didn't I just do this initially? Good question. Answer is I was hoping my awesome subscribers would vote for the easier stuff to do and they didn't. Oh, how naive I am. During this microcontroller transition, I've designed and manufactured the second and probably final prototype design for the rover. It's longer, and whereas the initial prototype couldn't really turn at all, this one can, albeit with quite a lot of vibration. I tried to fix this vibration by adding a quote unquote supporting beam, but it just made it worse, so we're not gonna talk about that. Our ESP32 is a pretty similar board to our Arduino, apart from it's got some additional Wi-Fi and Bluetooth functionality, which might be useful for our Raspberry Pi based control system later, I'm not too sure just yet. The drawbacks are its GPIO pins, or more accurately, the lack of them. Each of my motors needs six motor connections. Doing the math, and we've run out of pins pretty quickly. We'll use this extender board to get more, and make an assumption about our system. For controlling the motors, we'll just connect the powers and grounds of the six, and only the encoders of the first two, each on an opposite side. This will provide the feedback to our theoretical control system. What you're seeing here is some demos of said new rover. You'll notice I'm holding this thing here. That's our RC transmitter, and that made an appearance in the initial prototype test. Oh, how amazing! it would be if I could just chuck the bigger motors into this now better frame that can actually turn, 
drive it with this and make my whole video about that. But psych! Again, my subscribers that I of course harbor absolutely no ill will towards decided that I should not do that and voted for the non-RC option. And like this wasn't even close. The other polls were close-ish, but this one made me genuinely realize I've got some people preying on my downfall watching this right now. For now though, we need to get this transmitter switched out for this Raspberry Pi 5. But I didn't buy this one. PCBWay were kind enough to give me one from their online store. When I've worked with PCBWay in the past, I've utilized their online services. For example, PCB manufacturer for this and CNC milling for this. I've never used their 3D printing capabilities, but given how my printer is acting up, which I'm not going to actually cover in this video, but look at all these prints I had to do for this rover, it might be a future video thing. Both the store and services are priced really well, and the quality of production is great, so feel free to check them out. But why even target a Raspberry Pi in the first place? Well, as this commoner rightly points out, RC and a Raspberry Pi aren't even that comparable. The whole point of this rover is to be able to be used on some hypothetical planet that isn't Earth, which is going to be pretty far away. If we take Mars, for example, even at its closest point in orbit to Earth, sending a signal would take four minutes there and four minutes back, which is literally capped by the speed of light. Which is a problem we can't really get around, so I'm gonna dislike myself for saying this, but it's going to be necessary for the rover to be able to localize itself in its environment. Essentially, I can't be the rover's eyes, because to send any images or video to me is going to take that eight minutes that we just talked about. So the rover needs to understand where it is and how it got there. We'll equip the rover with this. It's just a simple webcam and it's connected to our Raspberry Pi 5. The Pi runs a script that's gonna help us localize our scene. This video feed here is what the rover sees. When the rover moves, it brings the camera with it and our scene changes barely. But over larger distances, say a meter, this change is pretty obvious. To get the rover to know it's moved that meter, or 10 centimeters, or 1 centimeters, I've developed a system that tracks the distortion of the frame. Here's my rough idea. Notice how when the camera moves, the frame that it represents changes gradually over time, disappearing at the edges, and our objects in the center of the frame gradually get bigger. Well, what if we track those objects in the middle? For example, take this edge. I've used some feature tracking Python code to find this. As we move the camera, and hence our frame, the scene distorts, changing where this feature is in the frame. This frame, of course, is made of pixels, and as that frame moves, and the camera moves, and that distortion therefore occurs, the feature's location in the frame actually changes. We can measure how much it changes, say every half a second with a change of pixels in the x direction and the y direction. But what does this frame actually change relative to? Like this, this, this here is our present frame. And since the camera is not moving, we are getting no change in the pixel value. But start moving and we do. Well, in a two camera system, it's relatively simple. We can take the feed from camera one and just compare it to camera two. And if you think my talking is out of my behind right now, weird way to say that, that this would work, just look in a mirror. You have two eyes. This dog has two eyes. Lots of animals have two eyes. The comparison of the two frames is what gives us depth, i.e. how far things are away from us. But in a one camera system like this system, we've only got one frame to work with. So we can't compare in real time. That means we've got to get creative. To get our pixel values and subsequently theoretically simple rover localization, we'll take a past frame from 0.5 seconds ago and track the feature across the present and past frame. This is what that looks like. It's what the rover sees and it looks like, well, crap. But it does give us fairly accurate pixel values. Now when I say fairly accurate pixel values, I mean that across 10 iterations of testing, the exact same movement of my camera, my total pixel change fluctuated by about 40%. This change is largely due to the feature tracking initially starting off different points, like sometimes it's here, or here, or here. Each of those points then changes differently across the scene. 
This inaccuracy just kind of seems to be a problem with mono vision systems, which just means one camera. They aren't all that accurate for distance perception without something else to aid. Good news is that aiding tool doesn't have to be another camera with another frame. It can actually just be this little chip. Now, not this specific IMU, it's kind of like ass. So instead, we are going to use the one inbuilt to this big camera. And a big boy camera, this truly is. Because this isn't your typical red, green, blue camera, like this webcam. It's something called an event-based camera. Event cameras are different because they see based off of light intensity of individual pixels. It makes them really good for motion blur. Like here, the camera's being moved really quick, but despite that in the purely event frames, i.e. a frame that's made up of either white or black pixels, we can actually make out the rover. In the real frames, i.e. what a normal camera sees, that rover is all but impossible to make out. As for our software behind the scenes, we'll use the same logic to find those features and take those pixel values like we did on our webcam, and we'll implement that on our event-based camera. Apart from, as opposed to the scene looking like this, it now looks like this. And yes, the quality is horrible. It's a 346 by 240 frame, which YouTube's gonna scale up to a 1920 by 1080 frame. But potato, potato, you get the idea. Two months of software shenanigans later, and the regular frames from the camera with the event frames can be combined into this augmented frame. Naturally, we need a user interface to show what's going on, so there's this. The lower half has all that real-time frame information, and the top half has important status information and our plots of interest. Now you people wanted to use a Raspberry Pi and ESP32 to act as the brains behind our system, much to my dismay. And it's important as the rover runs, the status of those two things are continually checked and maintained. This thing in the middle is the holy grain of this stupid rover. It's a real-time plot of exactly how the rover has moved based entirely on what the camera sees. This took a long time, but it does work really well most of the time. It relies on a static frame, i.e. nothing is allowed to actually move in the frame as the rover moves. Otherwise, there's a pretty high chance that the event pipeline i.e. the real-time location plot just goes off to infinity and <laughs> dies, I guess. But considering this is a technology intended for planetary rovers, that static assumption is actually pretty valid, at least in my opinion, since Martians don't exist to get their annoying moving legs in the way of the fancy camera software things going on. When I initially gave you guys the options to vote on this, I had no idea it was going to be this horrible to implement correctly, but it's working, uh, mo mostly. There is a slight caveat that if you try to turn the rover 90 degrees, the localization plot does normally break, like at least half the time. I think it's because the whole scene changes, like in this initial feature tracking video, I actually do a 90 degree turn, and you can see that all these features that we were just tracking just kind of have to stop existing on the edge of the frame. It's what they should do, because after all, that scene has changed and those features are no longer there. But from a tracking where I am point of view, this is really annoying. Regardless, we will tick this Raspberry Pi box suitably done. If anyone wants me to take this further, I might, but I'm kind of missing having a little bit of a social life, so I might just ignore you. Anyways, the motors we are using, which yes, are still the small ones, come with these 16-bit quadrature encoders. It's useful because it allows us to get an estimation on exactly how many times the shaft of these motors spin. Now, on the end of those shafts is, of course, wheels, and we've got six of them that allow the rover to drive. Nothing new here, but we know that with one turn of that shaft equals one turn of the wheel. By considering the circumference of the wheel, which we can just get by multiplying pi by the diameter, which is 65 millimeters, we can take a guess at exactly how much distance the rover should cover 
with one singular wheel spin. So, as the rover drives, if we pull the number of bits coming from these encoders, divide it by 16, we can get a good idea on how many times the wheels have actually turned. Take the amount of turns and multiply it by the circumference of the wheel, and that gives us a distance. In reality, the wheels do slip a little bit, and that changes depending on what surface you're driving on. But for simplicity, we'll just assume a constant scaling factor. With that, we can create this secondary distance plot. It will be represented by this blue dotted line. This pipeline can actually do 90 degree turns to some accuracy, but ultimately, overall, it is less accurate. Like here, the rover was driven in a square. We are gradually making that shape, but it's not exactly 100% correct, with the ESP32 not only controlling the system, but also providing a somewhat accurate distance plot, we'll take this and we'll tick it right off. Both of these pipelines for distance estimation have been combined onto this user interface, and now we can do a final test on a plywood environment I made. The environment has these little 3D printed bumps on it just to show off the flexibility of the rover's design, but also the adaptability of the distance pipelines. You would think that driving over these might throw off the event-based distance estimation because the scene changes so rapidly as the rover climbs, but this didn't end up actually being the case. So overall, this actually works really well. This black line here is our true value. It represents this black tape path on our plywood environment. As before, this red line on the actual final plot is our event pipeline, and the blue is the encoder pipeline. On this particular test, the encoder pipeline works better than the event pipeline with the event pipeline overshooting a bit. This rover is still being controlled via an RC controller, and now that we have accurate distance plots, making a control system to traverse backwards through these plots could be done. I'm not going to do that at this point because I just think this rover is suitably awesome and I've still got to worry about getting those motors switched out. Well, no problem. Those motors I ordered near the start of the video have arrived. What, what, what is that? That is not the wheel in the photo. <laughs> what in the AliExpress? Meh, no problem. It was cheap as chips. I'll order the wheel again. What, what is that? Oh, no problem. Surely these tariffs will be exceptionally reasonable and not completely halt trade between the two largest economies of the world. Guys, you know how you, you, you voted for the, the smaller motors? Yeah, I mean, these numbers are fairly close, so we'll forget about it. I'll take this one off because my hands are kind of kind of tied at the moment. Overall, I ended up going a pretty different direction with this rover than I initially intended, but overall, this thing is cool as hell. I, I deem it so, <laughs> and most definitely the hardest thing I've ever built. Big thanks to my friends as well, whose feet you've seen throughout mainly the second half of this video. I couldn't have done this project without them and their superior intellects to my own. So I'll see you in a month. Hopefully, goodbye.